I live in a dream world. Life is a stage for me. Sometimes, you know, when I'm sleeping, I see full scenes. I see rooms decorated, the people, the hairs, dresses, and I see jewelry on people. And I wake up in the morning, I say, I have to do this. And here comes the jewelry. <laughs> Like many little girls, I was always interested in jewelry, dressing up, makeup, and I think that little girl is still inside me. And I remember playing around my grandmother and my mother's jewelry. I was begging them to open the safe for me so I can, you know, discover what's inside. And you walk in the busy Nishanta street, you open the door and you are in another world. So, you know, we didn't want to make a um, display of jewelry. Because actually, in a way, we don't sell jewelry. We sell arts, we sell dream. I want to create pieces that is really contemporary, but at the same time, I want them to be timeless. Since the beginning, when I started doing scarabs, turtles and evil eyes, I think after nine years, those are still the most popular ones. Insects, that really similar to me in character because I find myself really strong, really determined, but at the same time, I'm really fragile emotionally. Insects are just like that. You can crash them in a second, but at the same time, they survive for millions of years. I made a jewelry collection, a capsule collection for them. And we used a lot of pineapples, a lot of hearts, stars, and animals. It was a really, really happy kind of collaboration. I was so touched that a French house chose a younger Turkish designer. We created a special perfume just for this bottle, which it's a limited edition that was sold in the first day. And it was a romantic collaboration for me. I have many muses and many women I'm really inspired by. When I saw Queen Maxima of Holland, Crown Princess Marie Chantal of Greece, or Katy Perry, it was a really good moment. I think all the Asian arts and Asian aesthetics, they're also really big impact on me. People always ask me, how do I combine Chinese and Ottoman arts together in my design? They're both really important ancient empires. A lot of traditions and cultures are shared. We all come from Central Asia. In a way, there is sisters, brothers. It just works together perfectly. When my flight first lands to China, in a really bizarre, strange way, I feel really at home and really part of the culture. I always loved cufflinks. And you look at gentleman's jacket, sometimes you see the cufflinks, sometimes you don't see. It's somehow like a little surprising element. I was working as a corporate in a Chinese state-owned company, and I learned a lot. And when I decided to start Begum Khan, I worked two jobs. Because I really like my work, but I really like what I was doing with Begum Khan as well, so I decided maybe I can do both. And for a while I did, but then when Begum Khan really took off, you know, I had to move to Istanbul, hire people, start a new office. So it wasn't a difficult decision. It just happened, you know, the way it's supposed to happen. This 
Istanbul, it's a really beautiful, magical place to create jewelry because we have centuries old uh, craftsmanship. And that's my ambition to keep this handcrafting. I really like that transference of emotions and thoughts from my thoughts to their brain, their brains to their hands, from their hands. It's an amazing process. I was born and raised into a family of Ottoman art collectors, so I think their aesthetics had a big impact on me. Every piece is very unique, but you can wear them with uh, daily clothes, or you can wear them for a, a night out in the city, or for a ball or for a wedding. I think they're very versatile, and I think that's what I love about her designs. When she first started, I was like, oh my God, can guys wear this piece of jewelry? And she said, oh yeah, of course. She has such an amazing knowledge of history and art and culture and everything, but also she puts that knowledge into a fantasy world, a wonderland. We're both designers and we're trying to create uh, our own design journey along with our personal one. Begum is the most fun and loyal friend. Three summers ago, I called her and I was like, you know, I'm feeling like a bit down. And she's like, what do you mean? Summer is already here. And on top of that, the fashion is so much fun this season. There are so much tassels and fringes and colors and big jewelry. Like, everything is going on for us. It's her way of being happy. I was like, oh my God, this is the first time a friend of mine just consoled me with fashion, and this is the first time it happened to me. With my last collection, you will see many evil eyes coming together. So with this collection, after COVID times and all these uh, world difficulties, I wanted to create a protective shield around myself, and with all this evil eyes, I feel better. The concept of a person's house as his castle is still very relevant. You know, the idea that you retreat to somewhere very safe and secure. Essentially, a cocoon of tranquility. The concrete house has a connotation of something very masculine and very hard and very heavy. I wanted to artistically express the house as a floating volume of concrete that levitate amongst the landscape. I dream to have a house that I can continue the journey of uh, evolving to a house that something is not stagnant, meaning I can display my nice furniture, nice art pieces. We had a different arrangement. I told him, let me talk to you, let me spend time chatting with you, let's have a drink together, let's have lunch together. He understood that I approach it as a process, a conversation. That is essential for the kind of work we do. A home is, I would say, one of the most difficult projects to navigate successfully because the brief is not a commercial brief, it's very personal.
won't just give me one proposal with a sketch for the house and that sketch until today when the house is completed. I have to say it's like 95% as per the first sketch. It looks simple, but it's like a piece of sculpture. One that I believe can live many, many years in terms of a design. The idea that we have this courtyard and the use of the concrete and the stone to frame the views, the spatial experience is one that is reminiscent of Chinese courtyard houses. Each suite looks out to its own private courtyard and that layering of privacy was something that was very important for the house design. So when we're in the room, looking out to the Sky Garden, we are like in a Japanese Ryokan kind of feeling. Actually, I grew up in Dustin Hill. Back then, my father had a workshop uh, in the shop house that we live. So from very young, you know, uh, I already exposed to furniture building, so furniture is in my blood. Every piece of furniture in this house is quite unique. Woon came up with an idea about something semi-see-through. So the idea of this charcoal screen is being conceptualized from a Kyoto-style burnt charcoal design. He designed a beautiful wine cellar. I'm very happy with that. He sparked the idea of having an oak table there and I evolved the space into a sitting area inside the wine cellar. These are some of the journey that I really enjoy working with him. There are some very important artistic elements in the house. One of them was a bonsai arrangement that I had sketched out that I wanted to anchor the dining room view. So it took us about close to two years to select a bonsai, the shape that he won. And after I found it, and he started designing the tray that holding the uh, bonsai tree and floating from the pond and it turned out to be such a nice feature of the house. The entire journey for building this house with my architect was a very, very fun and exciting one because we are not just about designing for the sake of designing, we became good friends. When I design houses, I try to figure out a way to make sure that the home is 
almost like it's a safe haven for someone to retreat to. A new way of living where the home provides an opportunity for him to look after his guests, to display his, his hospitality to friends, and essentially a cocoon of tranquility. I don't think anybody knows what real Indian food is. Even I don't. We have five different seasons. We have different terroirs, different cultural influences, which I think is great for cooks like me who can freely pick up from within the geographical boundaries of what India is today and come up with things that are surprising, are unique, are fun, even to other cooks. So there's no one way to describe it, and I don't even try. I couldn't think of a better backdrop to explore uh, modern Indian cooking than Bangkok. There's such a big, strong connection between the culture of the two countries, the language, the ingredients, the religion. I mean, to be able to take techniques which are Indian and then apply them to ingredients that we find around us in Thailand, I think it's a perfect way to showcase that. There is not one Indian technique we use. It's an entire repertoire, right from drawing umami from vegetables or using the charcoal, using the tandoor, to uh, fermentation, to pickling, to breads. It's endless. This is our technical take on what makes a curry. The dish is layered with five different flavors, but all of it comes together with a macadamia milk, which is locally sourced. That milk kind of transfers each flavor to the guest. And to me, that is what a curry does. It's not simply the act of drinking the broth, it's the layered flavors in there which makes a curry most interesting and so satisfying to eat. He used to travel abroad, come back with different recipes and ingredients. In the 90s, he would be making hummus and risotto and stuff like that uh, in the kitchen, in our little kitchen in India, where nobody had even heard of these things. And I would always be standing next to him, uh, watching him enjoy himself so much, and I kind of felt part of uh, the magic as well. I think that stayed with me, that uh, joy of not just eating, but also the labor of love that goes into cooking. My dad was always ahead of his times and he instilled that need to do what you love as well. He was just hoping I would go to Paris, study, come back and cook nice food for him, but I never came back. So he's still waiting to get his money's worth. I heard that there was an opportunity for me to do something in India. So I decided to quit my job in uh, Copenhagen to move back to India. But I made a pit stop in Bangkok, spent a couple of months here before I went back. And yeah, I fell in love with the city. I fell in love with the people, the ingredients, and I never left. I never thought about being a woman so much. Again, I think this goes back to my father who raised me not to think about if I was a man or a woman or where I came from. It was you know, the content of my character, my abilities, my need to work hard, 
and just get the job done. I think I was raised in a way where I didn't think about these things. There is such a vacuum of knowledge about true Indian food, not only with people who are not Indian, not only for people abroad, but even within India. When this idea started, I think we took a step to catalog what we could find and hopefully get to an answer one day. How could we define Indian cuisine? This last year and a half has changed me completely. That's when I realized what is under my control is my own health and how I react to the pandemic. Now I definitely spend time uh, exercising, working out. I find that it gives me mental clarity, it gives me focus. I started cooking for friends who wanted to get healthier. First they said, oh, just for a day, two days, three days, and the next thing they were like taking food from us for a month almost. Maybe this is another way we can help people. It's very refreshing for someone, an outsider, to come and then, you know, take pride and joy in discovering the local Thai ingredients. I think what Gariba can contribute to the food scene in Bangkok is through her boundless creativity. She always comes up with new ways to experience something. Here is showing real Indian flavors without the stuffiness of a fine dining restaurant. It's making it more accessible and uh, easy. I think Indian cuisine has the resources to give chefs to kind of push Asian food beyond what it has been so far and make it more relevant to where we are today in this day and age.